Hey guys, I have a really cool opportunity to interview one of Quincy's own brain surgeons. Like how often do you ever get to meet a brain surgeon? And so I'm here with Brian Anderson, who's graciously allowed me to, uh, to interview him and talk to him about a couple of different things. And I ran into Brian a couple different times over the summer and just moved to town, right? Yeah, exa almost exactly a year ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Almost a year ago. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. Um, one of the questions, I, the reason I thought it was kind of interesting, just because you never meet brain surgeons, well, I never have. Yeah. I'm sure they're around, right? Yeah. But how, when did you know you wanted to be a doctor? And then when did it turn into, like, not only do I want to be a doctor, I want to be a brain surgeon doctor. Not a neurologist, like I messed up, yeah. but uh, a brain surgeon. Uh, so, it, kind of ironically, I grew up on a farm in Utah, and uh, my dad's a farmer, he still farms, my whole family's always farmed. Neither one of my parents went to college or anything like that. And when I was, you know, probably around 10 years old, 12 years old, my dad asked me, just like all parents do, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And at that point, I was old enough to realize the NFL probably was not in my future. Right? <laughs> uh, and yeah. so I thought, well, geez, you know, and I, I think I responded, I, I think I'll be a farmer, you know, that's, that's uh -huh. what you are, and that seems cool, and that's what I knew. And and my dad was fine with that, but he, he said, uh, he said that's, that's good, that'd be great. He said, but you have to go to college first. Hmm. And so I thought, well, geez, if I have to go to college, then what am I going to do? And uh, in the small community that I grew up in, uh, really within almost the entire county, the very rural part out west, uh, there were two family medicine doctors, and they were the most respected, right? They were at the football games to uh -huh. take care of any injuries. You know, they were just the only, I mean, everybody knew who the doctor was in town. And I thought, well, geez, I want to be that person. I want to be the one that everybody looks up to and uh -huh. respect for and everything like that. And so that was when medicine very first entered my mind. I always loved science, and that just kind of seemed to fit and make sense. Uh, they were the rich people in town, right? Mm -hmm. They had the most money. I thought, well, geez, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> so that's kind of when I, when I decided. So I say around 12. Uh, but then... Huh brain surgery. I knew I wanted to do surgery because I grew up, again, farmer. I love to work with tools and all those things. And so I would say two, uh, I was planning to do orthopedic surgery. Not okay. a bad field, sure, but uh, I got into it. I got some exposure to it and I liked the surgeries, but there were some, some things about it just didn't click as well for me. Um, I thought some of the stuff was kind of boring, to be honest. The science wasn't that intriguing. And so in the beginning of my third year of medical school, I got some exposure to neurosurgery and I thought, you know, this meets the desire I have for instrumentation and a lot of technology and things like that in surgery. Uh, but the, the science behind it, which is neuroscience, the brain, I thought was, I mean, this stuff was amazing. And yeah. uh, I thought, you know, this makes more sense for me. And so that's when I transitioned from orthopedic surgery into neurosurgery. And pretty much the day I walked into that, I walked in where the residents were and kind of said, hey, you know, my name's Brian, I'm a med student, I think I want to be a neurosurgeon. They kind of just kind of said, oh, okay, well, you know, <laughs> this is, I'm so-and-so, that's so-and-so. Uh -huh. And uh, and I kind of just immediately felt like this is home, like this is where huh. I'm supposed to be. And uh, it was a perfect fit, and, and I've never had a hesitation since. So, so if somebody, like a little 12-year-old, might happen to see this video at some point, <laughs> um, what kind of years does it take to get through to something like this you've got med school which is three on top of the already four right well so then, so you have to have a degree in something uh -huh. right and uh and so that's a four-year degree college degree so one obviously you have to get into college and uh -huh. then in college you're gonna have to get some pretty darn good grades you're gonna take the mcat and everything so four years of undergraduate you get a bachelor's degree in something you score well enough uh, in all your classes and the tests to get accepted into medical school. Medical school is then four years, so it's an oh. additional four years on top of four years, so you have eight years of school, <laughs> and then for neurosurgery, it's an additional seven years of training. Okay. Uh, that's the minimum, and then if you wanna do fellowships or something, that can be additional years on top of that. Wow. So it's four and four, which is eight years, plus another seven years, so 15 years from the time you start freshman of college until you can be done with residency. Uh, and actually have a job. That's amazing. <laughs> that's a so lot it of is schooling. A long haul. It's, but it's, I mean, it's a if you're long. messing with people's brains, that's kind of important, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. And, and everybody, you know, it's an important process and everybody needs to go through it. It's very yeah. grueling. 
you know, each step you think, well, college, once I'm through there and in medical school, things, at least I'll be in medical school, right? That'll be, I'll kind of have arrived. And you realize mm -hmm. now, because if you want to be a neurosurgeon, you can't just get through med school. You have to be at the top of your class. Mm -hmm. You have to score in the top quarter percentile on the national exams for your certifications. You said top quarter percentile, like yeah. point two well, five percent? No, the top 25 percent. Oh, I'm top, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, that's not but, nearly as important. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but to be fair, uh, you know, if you're in the 25th percentile, that still may not be good sure. enough. You know, a couple of specialties that are more competitive, you really do kind of need to be in the top five to ten percent to really have a reasonable chance. Sure. Wow. Uh, on those on those tests, so so you have to not just get through med school, but you have to be excel at it, right? And then you think, well, once I'm in residency, that'll be it, and then you realize residency is. At least, at least twice as hard as medical school. No way. If not, maybe even three times. The hours, you know, the demand. And, but again, it's important because you learn. You learn how to, it's like becoming a Navy SEAL or something sure. like that. You learn you can do things that you never imagined you can do. Uh -huh. you, know, you can be awake for 30 hours, and when you're ready to walk out, all of a sudden there's an emergency, and you learn that you can immediately get yourself in a situation to, to deal with a crisis, save somebody's life, and, and do it without you know blinking and wow you know, that's kind of what you want from someone who's whose life you know who is going to have someone's life in their hands right so i do think it's it's an, an important process and just kind of required you know huh. so that no matter what happens people can keep that composure wow wow so obviously you've got to be smart and you talked about that what's what if that's number one, what's number two most important thing in order to be able to make it through this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, in, because you're a surgeon, mm -hmm. you have to have, obviously, technical skills. Mm -hmm. And some people are born with more technical skills than others. I think growing up on a farm was very advantageous because I just grew up with tools in my hands all the mm -hmm. time. And some people just have more inherent talent in that than others. Okay. But that's inside the OR which you learn as you get into practice is actually a smaller part of your your job than yeah. than you would otherwise expect. You would think, oh, right. well, that's really all that matters. In reality, if a patient doesn't trust you to go to surgery, then it doesn't matter how good you are. Sure. Right? And, and so, honestly, I think the ability, well, just to simply have compassion and understanding for patients, because I don't get to see people who come in and are like, oh, no, everything's fine. I just wanted to say hello. You know, they right. only come and see me when they have a problem. Sure. And these problems are serious. Like I yeah. have a big brain tumor, you know. I'm yeah. 28 years old, and I just developed some symptoms, and I found out I have a brain tumor. Oh, like wow. that's a horrific place for anyone to find themselves. And if you're not someone who can empathize and relate and and recognize and treat that person as a person, and, and not just a tumor or mm -hmm. something, then I think it really does limit your effectiveness because people won't trust you, and rightfully so. Right. Uh, you know, so I think aside from being smart, you know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I love I that one. That's really important. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's I'm, a good I'm one. I undervalue too much in my specialty, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Well, they talk about bedside manners, and there's yeah. part of that that goes a long, long way. It does. Yeah, especially when you're talking about somebody cutting your head open. <laughs> yes. It takes a lot. Of, oh, know, man. I'm constantly amazed. You know, I did a, a big brain tumor earlier this week, you know, and... and he was waking up, you know, after surgery and stuff. And every so often, you know, I mean, you kind of get tied up in doing this day to day. But but watching him wake up and stuff, it kind of just came through my mind again. This person, right, this mm -hmm. person in this situation trusted me, right, yep. literally said, okay, I'm going to go to sleep and you're going to cut out this brain tumor and I'm trusting that you're going to keep me alive and that I'm going to wake up from this. And yeah. that's that's a lot of... That's a lot of, I mean, as much trust as you can really have in anyone, I guess. Right. And uh, to do it, I mean, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm not a stranger now, but I'm not far from a stranger. You didn't sure. know me two weeks ago, and now you let me open you up and, and do that. So wow. uh, I'm all kind of always amazed, you know, that, that, and sometimes that's the only thing that will occasionally hit you, you know. Like, that's a lot of... That's a lot of trust. It's a lot of responsibility and sure. and everything. But again, why that process takes so long to get to, because uh, it is important. Because that is the type of trust people are putting in you. Well, speaking of the trust and some of those things, I mean, I see your your diploma on the wall or whatever from Penn State University. Yeah. I think that in Quincy, we have some super awesome doctors. I really do, and I think that we've got some specialties here that 
uh, parallel or exceed even in bigger cities and those kinds of things. And I think a lot of times it, it gets overlooked or nobody really pays attention to that. Can you just, can you brag on yourself for a little bit? Like, you know, where, what do we really have in you, Brian, as a brain surgeon in, you know, at QMG here in Quincy, like, what kind of skill level do we have? Yeah, and, and that's, that's very true. And, uh, and sometimes there's no question, you know, like I could have stayed at Penn State, I could have gone to, you know, wherever, sure. right? I could have got a job at Mayo or, or, you know, any other university hospital, Barnes or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I didn't, it's not because I couldn't get a job there, right? It's because I'm a farm boy uh -huh. and that's just not the environment that I like to be in. Sure. And uh, I'm sure anybody who's been in academic hospitals and stuff has felt that kind of loss and this giant vacuum, you know, and feeling mm -hmm. kind of like you're just one in a million kind of thing. And that's just not really me. And uh, sure. and there's a lot of things about academics that I find frustrating. And that lack of patient connection mm -hmm. isn't something that I was, you know, I didn't go through all of this to, to be in that type of a situation. I wanted to have relationships with my patients and be able to connect a little bit more personally with them. Sure. And the reason I ended up in Quincy, I'm not from the Midwest, not from this area at all, I'm from a long ways away. I have a family, of course it'd be great to be closer to my parents and my siblings and all of those things, but I am a neurosurgeon, so I can't right. go to any town, any community. And so I looked for uh, a, a job that would allow me to have my own practice, which means I get to make my decisions, I get to manage patients the way I choose, I get to hire staff that work with me. Nice. And if they don't work well for whatever reason, then I know I'm not forced to maintain them, which is oftentimes awesome. the case when you're employed in a hospital or something like that. And so, so Quincy offered me that through QMG. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in a community like Quincy, there shouldn't be a bunch of neurosurgeons doing lots of highly complex stuff. It just shouldn't happen. But because of the geography, the towns in the area, there are a lot of people that sure. live close to here, but there really aren't any substantial sized towns. And so Quincy over the years has developed uh, as kind of a place where the medical uh, technology has concentrated. And so even though Quincy is a relatively small community, it's able to support a lot more of the, the more complex stuff like you would find right. in larger cities, which is very advantageous. So it's kind of just this perfect constellation. Mm -hmm. I get to raise my family in a small community. I get to enjoy my driving and out of work, driving past cornfields and, sure. and horses and, and cattle and things like that. But I, uh, but I also don't have to sacrifice and give up a lot of the higher training that I received and spent a long time learning. Yeah. And so I did a fellowship in functional neurosurgery, which is okay. consists of just, which is what you would imagine, it's focused on function. So it's not brain tumor resection. It is, I have, I can't, I have tremors, right? My mm. hands shake to where I can't feed myself. I can do a brain procedure called deep brain stimulation to stop that tremor. Oh, uh, wow. Right? I'm, I'm someone who's had four back surgeries, but I have chronic back pain and my legs hurt all the time. Everyone says there's no other surgeries. There's nothing that can be done for me. Uh, I just today did three spinal cord stimulators. And so I put in uh, electrodes on the spinal cord that allow, the, that allow us to block that pain signal so the patient doesn't actually feel their pain anymore. And wow. uh, these things change people's lives and they re restore function. And that's why that term exists. It also includes epilepsy. I do vagal nerve simula simulators for epilepsy. I did one of those two days ago. Wow. Uh, and so that's the functional side. And sure. I also did a fellowship in spine focused on minimally invasive spine. So robotic spine surgery. So oh, wow. uh, I guess it's been almost a year ago. I think it was in September of last year, we did the very first robotic spine case in Quincy. Wow. And that was the very first with that, with that robotic system uh, it was the very first, I'm pretty sure, in the whole region. Uh, we had a, we had this before St. Louis. Uh, wow. I think Chicago had a robot. I think Peoria, about the same time, got a robot. But again, you know, these are yeah. you know, that that's kind of where we're at. Uh, so again, I've done a couple of deep brain stimulator uh, cases. Uh, wow. These are things that prior you had to go to at least to Springfield or St. Louis, uh, something like that, to have those things done. Uh, the type of pain stuff that I do. You're not going to find even in in the in the region. Uh, hmm. You're you're going to Chicago uh, is probably the closest. Some some stuff in St. Louis, 
but I would say even even more so than Columbia. And I and again, I would I would I would say that the complexity of the interventional uh, pain stuff that I'm doing is probably at least as you know at least on par with Chicago and St. Louis. If not, I would maybe even argue a little bit better. And that and that's credited to my fellowship training at Penn State, where I got to really focus on this. Uh, I did, you know, I did ask you to brag because I do want to hear those kinds of things because I, I don't think that Quincy people really appreciate what, uh, what we have Correct. and whether that's in you as the brain surgeon, which I'm really asking you to, to, to brag about. I mean, that's crazy. You just said, I did three of those today. You know, like, eh, just three, three of those. <laughs> you know, I took out two tumors, three, three spinal things, you know, like yeah. that's the way that the day goes. Yeah. That's awesome. Like I'm so pumped that yeah. you're here and that you can you can do those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, what else? I mean, robotic spine surgery. You've got the, the you know stopping the yeah, spinal uh, cord stimulators. Yeah, that's yeah. right on the tip of my Bay tongue. Stimulators. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, again, along the line of those functionals, I do C2 ganglionectomies, uh, which is basically removing a ganglion where the nerve comes out of the spinal cord to treat occipital headaches. Wow. Uh, and that was that's the first uh, I did that. Uh, wow. That's not a very common procedure, so we don't see a lot. Uh, but but I did one of those about six seven months ago here, and that was the first one in the region. Wow. Uh, and uh, a lot of what I do is really focused on technology. So there are new uh, spine screws. So most screws are made out of titanium. They may be they, there are some cobalt chrome uh, spinal implants and things like that. Uh, we put in, in a patient who has cancer, metastatic cancer, the problem is when you put that kind of instrumentation into the spine, it then causes artifact with imaging, right? So you get a CT scan, but because of the metal implants, it causes scatter and it blurs your ability to see anything. Ooh. So you can imagine if you're a patient who has metastasis to the spine, it's really hard to follow what that tumor is doing because you sure. can't see when you get repeat imaging. Well, there's a brand new company out of Sweden uh, and uh, it's the only FDA approved. They're, they're screws that are made out of carbon fiber. <laughs> and so the cool thing about them is they're radiolucent. Huh. And, uh, and so I was doing a debulking of a tumor in the spine and uh, needed to be able to stabilize the spine. Uh, young person, right? Uh, I mean, you really want to give this, want to give her every chance, right? right? To get the best treatment she can possibly get. And, uh, and so I, you know, I talked with the hospital and said, I understand these are more expensive and everything else, but I really want to be able to do this for this patient. And we were, and we did, uh, she uh, fortunately has done remarkable. This was about, this was in December mm -hmm. when we did it. She's done very well from that standpoint, recovered very well. Uh, we had no issues or complications with the uh, carbon fiber, uh, instruments that we put in and, uh, and we were the first in the Midwest. Huh. Uh, no one had done any of those. Nowhere in the state of Illinois, nowhere in Missouri. Uh, I think MD Anderson, we were the ninth hospital in the country to do it. Uh, and we were the only non-academic hospital to do wow. it. And so you were looking at you know Mayo Clinic, UCSF, MD Anderson, Miami, uh, huh. Ohio State, and then QMG, Quincy, Illinois. That's awesome. So, so, yeah, wow. You know, pretty open and pretty, again, but to me, that's that patient connection, right? Right. You know, and I think if this was my wife, what would I want her mm -hmm. to have? Mm -hmm. You know, because if she can't get the best care in Quincy, then she should leave. Right. Uh, but at the same time, I know that the toll that that takes pays on patients, families, and everything else. So my goal is that I want to be able to offer as much as I possibly can to the people here so that they can be treated here at home and, and, and they can have it as you know, tolerable of a treatment for a horrible problem as they possibly can. That's and, awesome. You know, and I'm not, again, like you mentioned, there's a lot of great stuff going on. You know, the docs are pretty amazing. Uh -huh. And I, I definitely do think, coming from the outside world, I definitely don't think the community realizes the talent that they have. In, right, in I agree. Positions. And again, QMG attracts people mm -hmm. that are highly motivated and, and are very good and very talented, but have families and they want, and mm -hmm. that's important to them. Mm -hmm. And that makes them more relatable and stuff. And so honestly, I mean, I've been, I've been around the country. I've been trained in Utah, Oregon, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and now I live here. I've seen, I've visited hospitals from California to, to Florida. Uh, I've spent time all these different places. Uh, honestly, it's pretty impressive 
the type of professionals that that uh, Quincy has, uh, and you know I would trust you know most any of my colleagues here at QMG, you know to to take care of any of my family members, mm-hmm. uh, and it's it's pretty impressive. They're good people, and they're good people. Like, right. You know, more importantly, yeah. I mean, they're good people. And right. You never have to wonder what their intentions are. Why are they mm-hmm. doing something? And they're simply doing it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, mm-hmm. And I mean, not nobody's perfect, and medicine is tough. There's sure. no right answers. You know, it can be really tricky, uh, but but honestly, I never really question, you know, anybody's intentions or anything else, and, and I think we're pretty darn fortunate to have that here. Yeah. Love it. Hey, and speaking page. of paging, right? <laughs> this, this is the way that the it really goes for you, so I will, yeah. I'll wrap it up real quick. Um, do you have time to tell what your hobbies might be? You know, just something uh, fun? Sure. So, I mean, uh, I again, I grew up in a small town, so I love sports. I grew up playing lots of sports. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm a pretty avid outdoorsman, so if I yeah. can be hunting, that's what I want to be doing. Uh, I, 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 do, I do lots of hunting, pretty yeah. much everything. And then I have five kids, so I spend a lot of time <laughs> playing with my kids. That's enough. <laughs> yep. uh, so I like so, to be outdoors. I don't like, right. to, I mean, it's nice to visit cities, but I'm a, I'm a country kid, so I love to be outside. Yeah. Well, Brian, thank you so much. Like, we could go on and on and on. Obviously, your pager says time to go. Going. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks.